I'm truly delighted to present to you this evening some of my research, which brings together thought on the Quran, its language, and its interpretive traditions. Over time, different communities have developed different interpretive methods and approaches to understanding the Quran. I'll introduce an important debate over how to access the Quran's meanings, and then an important scholar who responded to that debate in an innovative way. I'll then talk about some of the far-reaching implications for how to understand the Qur'an and perhaps even other holy scriptures and texts. First, a word about my own experience and entry into this tradition. As Jim mentioned, I'm a scholar of Arabic language and literature and of Islamic thought by training. And over the course of my education, I've had the great privilege of spending significant periods of time studying and participating in scholarly and religious events and study circles all around Morocco, among other places. And this engagement in Morocco in particular started in 2010 when I did coursework alongside graduate students in the religious studies program at Muhammad V University in Rabat, which is the capital of Morocco. And here you can see um, a, a couple of pictures of, of where that took place. Um, the classroom that I studied in and that a lot of uh, major religious scholars in Morocco spend a lot of time studying in as well, and the, the, um, the faculty where we studied. And subsequently, I've spent almost every uh, time, every, almost every year, participating in religious and scholarly conferences, symposia, as well as less formal gatherings in various cities around the country. And it would be difficult to overstate the importance of this in my scholarship and my thinking. I've been inspired by a methodology known as scholarly companionship, or in Arabic, as-suhba al-ilmiya, which underlies a lot of my engagements in Morocco. Its core tenet is that it's important to study religious texts and other aspects of religion in dialogue with the communities that live by those texts and beliefs. So my, my study of classical Arabo-Islamic texts has been shaped by studying alongside my Moroccan brothers and sisters through discussion and dialogue with scholars of Islamic theology from universities, schools, Sufi orders, and local uh, religious networks all around the country. And here you can see some pictures, a couple from, uh, again, the, the classroom where the, um, many of Morocco's leading religious scholars study and graduate from, as well as some more formal symposia around the country, one of which was held in a, a Sufi shrine, um, which was a very special experience. The scholar whose work I'll present this evening, Al-Baqalani, is a towering figure in classical Sunni Islamic thought. He was a formative scholar in a few different disciplines, so he wrote one of the most prominent books on the idea of the Qur'an as a miracle. He was an important shaper of Islamic legal theory. And in jurisprudence, his work is so significant that some legal discussions refer to him simply as al-Qadi, the judge. He is also a major voice um, on thought on the Qur'an more broadly, and he's especially highly regarded in Morocco because he is one of the most formative figures in both the schools of law and of theology that are closely tied to Moroccan identity. But al-Baqalani's work has largely been studied in discrete, discipline-specific ways up until this point, rather than transdisciplinarily. So his broader contribution to Islamic thought has not yet been well understood. When I first got interested in his work, I wondered whether there were any distinctive themes that ran through the different types of books that he wrote, any concerns that stood out across his whole body of work. And the issue that I see him addressing across his writings is the central question of how to access the Quran's meanings. One of the things I found so interesting in reading his work is the ways that this theme comes up in different forms in fascinating ways across the different disciplines in which he wrote. I became intrigued by thinking about why this was such an enduring issue of concern for him. So while I've been researching and engaging with classical Arabic literature and Islamic thought for quite some time now, some parts of the project that I'm drawing on in this talk are relatively new work for me, and I'm currently in the process of writing a book that will bring together some of my uh, results of this research and, and some of my findings, and it's still very much a work in progress. So first I'll provide a brief introduction to the Qur'an. What is it? What are its features? How have Muslim communities thought about it over time? What sciences grew up around it, both as ways of understanding it and of responding to the message that it presents? I'll devote particular attention to the importance of the linguistic form of the Qur'an, the Qur'an's language, which has been a central area of focus in Islamic thought historically. 
The discourse, that is the writings and the discussions about the Quran's linguistic excellence, is an important place where al-Baqalani made his mark. So understanding how this discourse developed will be important for, in turn, understanding his intervention. Then I'll introduce some of the methods that different communities have used in interpreting the Quran and situate them in relationship to each other, showing how sometimes they diverge and thus raising important questions about the implications of using different methods to access the holy text. Then I'll introduce al-Baqalani and his contribution to Islamic thought and specifically his response to this question of legitimate ways of accessing the Quran. And this new perspective on his work is one that illuminates his mark on Islamic thought more clearly. Lastly, I'll conclude with some thoughts about the implications of this new view of al-Baqalani's work for the question of how to access the Quran, as well as for communities of scriptural interpretation more broadly. So now that I've provided this, Islam this preliminary context, I'll turn to giving a brief introduction to the Quran. Understanding its central status in Islamic thought is important for then understanding the debates around accessing its meanings, and then in turn for appreciating the significance of al-Baqalani's inter uh, intervention into this debate. The Quran is the holy scripture that is central to Islam, the religion of almost a quarter of the world's population. That's about the same number of people as live in North America, South America, and Europe combined. When we talk about the Quran, we're talking about a sacred text that is in various ways important, foundational, and holy to two billion people from different cultures and backgrounds. There is also great diversity among Muslim communities, so one major divide is between Sunnis and Shi'is, or Shiites, a split that originated with a disagreement over the rightful leader of the Muslim community. And on this map here, we can see Sunni Muslim communities in a teal color and Shi'i communities in kind of that pumpkin color. To sum it up briefly, Shiites have held that a descendant of Muhammad should lead the community, while Sunnis have wanted to select the community's leader on a basis other than bloodline. However, there are also other sub-communities within the world of Islam, and one important one that I'll return to later is Sufism. Sufi Islam can briefly be explained as a mystical form of Islam that emphasizes spiritual closeness to the divine. There's a great deal of diversity among Sufi orders, which can be found in many places within the Muslim world. So these are just a few quick definitions and distinctions that will be helpful later on. In Islamic thought, the Qur'an is considered to be the direct word of God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel in the seventh century of the Common Era over, in a, uh, over a 20 year period. The Qur'an positions itself as being an Arabic language revelation, a message from God to humanity in the same line as previous scriptures such as the Torah and the Gospels. It's comprised of 114 surahs, roughly equivalent to chapters, and these are arranged in approximate order of length from longest to shortest. The surahs range in length from just a few verses at the shortest to 286 verses at the longest. Many scholars consider the word Qur'an to mean recitation. And it's the orality of the Qur'an, that, it, that is, it's, it's being recited and hearing it aloud in Arabic has been an important part of its transmission and its reception. Sections of Qur'an are a part, an important part of Muslim worship, and children often learn from a young age to recite and memorize parts of the Qur'an or even the entire thing. Even in parts of the world where Arabic is not a widely spoken language, Qur'an recitation competitions can often be popular. Participants who don't speak Arabic often memorize Qur'an by listening and repeating the sounds aloud, and new technologies such as smartphone apps are available to hear a Qur'an recitation and aid in its memorization. And here on the screen, we can see an example of one of these apps, the smartphone app, alongside a well-known Malaysian Qur'an reciter who has won many Qur'an recitation competitions and uh, an image of a richly decorated page of Qur'an. The literary and linguistic form of the Qur'an has garnered much attention, and Islamic theology developed the idea that the Qur'an's superlative use of Arabic language to express its sublime meanings stands as a proof that the Quran is a revelation from the divine, that is, it's a miracle in linguistic form or in textual form. The Quran is a central source of Islamic law, theology, ethics, and thought on divine truth. 
Therefore, understanding its message and its meanings has been of utmost importance in the Islamic tradition. Different parts of the Quran have different styles and features. So some parts have short verses whose style has been compared by some to that of the Psalms, while other sections have longer verses that may deal with legal issues or issues such as the Day of Judgment and the Hereafter. So while it's impossible to represent the whole of the Quran style in a single excerpt, I'd like to briefly show you one short section of Quran to provide a feel for what it can be like to read it. This passage here is the first several verses of the second surah of the Quran, known in Arabic as Surah Al-Baqarah, which means the cow in English, so named because it references a narrative involving the children of Israel being commanded to sacrifice a cow. I'd like to point out a few features of these first verses of the surah, which are provided here alongside an English language rendering or interpretation. First, the Quran is quite self-referential. So in the second verse that you see here, it proclaims that it's a source of divine guidance and enjoins adherence to God's guidance. And this is a theme that reoccurs in different parts of the Quran. Secondly, the very first verse that you see here is comprised of three Arabic letters known as Alif, Lam, Mim. Some surahs of the Quran open with sets of Arabic letters as this one does. And these sets of letters are commonly known as the disconnected letters in Arabic, al-huruf al-muqatta'a. And in English, they are sometimes called the mysterious letters, owing to the fact that many have seen their meanings to be opaque or ambiguous or unclear in some way. And indeed, they have been the subject of many different explanations and interpretations, and we'll see what some of those have been in just a moment. Looking at the ways in which various scholars have dealt with these disconnected letters gives us insight into their approaches to parts of the Quran where there's not a consensus about the meaning. They're therefore a good lens through which to understand debates about how to interpret the Quran and how to access its meanings. Now that I've introduced the Quran and its importance in Islamic thought, I'll, we'll have a chance to look briefly at um, the importance of language in understanding the Quran and how to access its meanings. The body of work about the language of the Quran is really fascinating in its own right, and it's also important background for understanding al-Baqalani's contribution later on. The Quran announces itself as being in a clear Arabic tongue. The precise Arabic form of the Quran with its specific wording and arrangement is seen in the Islamic tradition as being so excellent that it could not be successfully imitated by humans and is therefore proof of the Quran's divine source. The idea of the Quran as being a miracle is rooted in the Quran itself in a series of verses that have, been come, to, that have come to be known as the challenge verses, ayat at tahaddi in Arabic. These verses, a couple of which you can see on this screen here, have been understood to rhetorically assert the idea that the Quran's use of language is eloquent and magnificent in ways superior to anything that humans or any created beings could reproduce. From this came the idea of the Quran as being a miracle, an idea that's commonly called ajaz al-Quran in Arabic, and more literally, that term conveys the idea that humans are rendered incapable of producing a text as eloquent and rhetorically magnificent as the Quran. In order to understand the significance of this idea, it's important to appreciate the central role that language and language arts have played in Arabo-Islamic culture and thought. Classical Arabo-Islamic society was strikingly focused on language and the crafts of poetry and rhetoric. Understanding how speech works linguistically and undertaking in-depth study of vocabulary and of grammar have been of huge importance, starting from a very early time in Islamic history. The first Arabic dictionary was created by the linguist and grammarian Al-Khalil bin Ahmed, who died around the year 790 of the Common Era in Basra, Iraq. And it's one of the oldest dictionaries in the world in any language. And we can see a copy of the, the cover of the book on the right of the screen here. Al-Khalil's linguistic work involved identifying where in the mouth or throat each Arabic letter is pronounced. And his dictionary is arranged not in alphabetical order, but rather in terms of each letter's place of articulation, that is where in the throat or mouth it's produced. So he starts with the letter Ain, which is the farthest back in the throat in Arabic, and he proceeds all the way up until the letter Mim, which is produced all the way at the front by the lips. 
And legend has it that Al Khalil, this is my favorite story about him, there's a lot to say about him, he was a really renowned figure, but legend has it that he died when he was one day pacing around at his local mosque and thinking deeply about how to articulate the sounds of the Arabic alphabet when he bumped into one of the mosque's pillars and perished. Another reflection of the privileged position of language arts in Arabo-Islamic society is the development of the Arabic calligraphy tradition, an example of which is shown on the left of the screen here, and that says the Arabic language al al-Arabiya in Arabic. The idea of the Quran as a linguistic miracle reflects the idea that this type of miracle was uniquely suited to a people who valued and recognized excellent language use. The 9th century scholar Ibn Qutayba recorded the famous formulation that can be summarized as follows. Moses had miracles in the form of magic, such as splitting the seas and splitting open a rock in the desert to produce water, because this type of miracle was most appreciated at his time. Jesus had medical-type miracles, such as reviving the dead and curing the blind and curing those who had leprosy, since medicine was especially valued at his time. Muhammad's miracle was the Quran itself, a book at the peak of eloquence, since at his time, eloquence was uniquely valued. Since the pre-Islamic Arabs prided themselves on their highly developed literary tradition, a miracle of an eloquent text was most suitable for them. That is, the Quran itself is the prime miracle of Islam, the proof of its divine source. And this miracle was understood to have different aspects, but the very linguistic form of the holy text came to the fore as being the most prominent one. Accordingly, each word and each phrase of the Quran has been the subject of intense study and contemplation. The earliest writings on this topic that have been preserved date to the 9th and 10th centuries of the Common Era, and they often defend the Quran's use of specific vocabulary, grammar, metaphor, and other linguistic features. These writings suggest that there may have been detractors, possibly from within the Muslim community, who criticized the Quran's use of language, which in turn pushed scholars to defend and explain the Quran's phrasing and its linguistic features. As the tradition of writing on the Quran as a miracle developed over time, though, the defensive elements recede and the focus turns instead to categorizing and classifying the elements of the Quran's language that render it so excellent. Eventually, some scholars enumerated dozens upon dozens of rhetorical figures and other aspects of the Quran's language seen to constitute its excellent form. In enumerating an ever larger number of types of rhetorical figures, this development can be seen as one that gestures toward the boundless, or some would even say infinite, excellence of the Qur'an. Another branch of this tradition about the Qur'an as miracle, or the Ajaz al-Qur'an tradition, developed in a different direction, and some prominent theologians turned to examining the Qur'an's eloquence in broader terms, asking what is it that makes any text eloquent? Scholars work to craft a theoretically robust basis for characterizing communication in general, one that could be applied to the Quran as well as poetry and prose produced by humans. The scholar whose thought I'll introduce later, Al-Baqalani, was one of the major contributors to the development of thought about the Quran's literary excellence. But as I'll argue, the nature of his contribution hasn't been fully recognized in past scholarship. I'll show how he uses his book on the topic of the Qur'an as a miracle to further a larger argument about how interpreters ought to access the Qur'an's meanings. Now that we've seen the Qur'an's status in Islamic thought, and more specifically the importance of its language, let's take a look at some of the main ways of interpreting the Qur'an that have developed. I'll then show how al-Baqalani intervened in this debate to try to establish the Arabic language as the means of understanding the Quran over and against other possible ways of doing so. The written record shows that there was some early hesitation about interpreting parts of the Quran that were not seen to be clear. For example, the 10th century theologian al-Khattabi writes, many of our predecessors feared commenting on the Qur'an and avoided it out of caution so as not to err and depart from what was intended, even if they were experts on language and scholars of religion. And he gives the example of one very prominent the uh, philologist who he says used to refrain from commenting on and trying to explain the Qur'an's rare or obscure vocabulary out of fear that he would err. Indeed, uh, this was an ongoing point of discussion 
is it legitimate to comment on, to try to explain parts of the Quran that were not um, universally considered to be clear? But Al-Khattabi in the same text also provides another account that says, the messenger of God, may God bless him and grant him peace, said, learn the Quran's grammar and seek the meanings of its obscure and rare words. So encouraging seeking out the meanings of words uh, that were not universally seen to be clear. So the Quran inspired a rich and robust tradition of discussion about the meanings contained within it, including of verses who me whose meanings were not universally seen to be clear, although there was continued debate about that. Interpretation of the Quran can be found in commentaries, also known as exegesis, which typically provide explanations of each verse of each surah in order. And we can see examples of long, multi-volume exegesis or interpretations here. Interpretations of the Quran's verses could be brought to bear on law, ethical frameworks, theological creed and doctrine, and other areas of belief and communal life. The centrality of the Quran as a source of knowledge and guidance for the individual and for society is reflected in the prominent status that the, that the, Quran, that the Quran has in these various areas of thought. But different communities of interpreters develop different ways of accessing the Quran's meanings. Those methods and their results were not always in dialogue with one another, and sometimes they even stood in opposition to each other. It's precisely this issue that al-Baqalani was concerned with, that is, how ought a reader or interpreter to understand and access the meanings of the Quran. In order to see how this, situa how this question was situated in the classical Arabo-Islamic tradition, we'll take a brief look at a couple of major representative commentaries. One of the most prominent commentaries uh, that's still widely regarded in Sunni Islam and uh, still read until today is that of a scholar named At-Tabari. At-Tabari was born in Amul, a city that lies in Iran today, and he died in Baghdad in 923 of the Common Era, or 310 uh, Hijri. So let's take a look at the interpretation that At-Tabari provides for the verse at the beginning of the Quran's second surah, which we saw earlier. I mentioned that the sets of letters that are found at the start of some surahs of the Quran, including this one, have been the topic of many different interpretations. At-Tabari presents a few of these interpretations, which I have summarized here. And he typically introduces the, in each interpretation with a chain of transmitters, that is, he lists the source of the idea. So for example, he might say, Yaqub related to us that Ibn Ali said that Khalid had narrated on the authority of Akrama, and then he would give the report itself. This attribution of the interpretation is of great importance because it roots that interpretation in the understandings of early members of the Muslim community or even Muhammad himself. So here we can see, and this is, uh, I've summarized from, from the Arabic, uh, he presents several different interpretations of what these three Arabic letters could mean. Uh, so he says, some, could, some say that it's one of God's names, it could be a name of the surah, it could be an oath, it could be that each of these letters has its own independent meaning. Uh, maybe each is a letter of the alphabet that has multiple meanings. They could each have a numerical value. And he says that he's not going to pass along the chain of transmitters for that particular account because he doesn't see it as trustworthy, but he does pass along that idea anyway. Um, he says others have said that these are just letters of the alphabet that don't have any particular additional meaning or that they indicate that the previous surah has ended and announce that a new surah is beginning. Al-Tabari concludes this discussion by saying that he finds the explanation that the letters have many different meanings to be correct, and that in light of this, all of the explanations that he's presented are correct, except the one that posits that the letters are just letters of the alphabet with no deeper meaning. He says that this explanation could not be right because it contradicts what the companions of Muhammad, the early members of the Muslim community, said about them. And he points out that it's often the case in language that a word can have many different meanings, and some of those meanings can be operating at the same time as each other. So the idea that these letters have multiple meanings that are in operation is uh, in line with how we understand language to function in general. Atabari draws heavily on received wisdom passed down from one generation to the next, seeking to understand the verses of the Quran as its first audiences would have hundreds of years before. He cites communally available resources in the forms of transmitted reports and classical Arabic poetry as the basis and grounding of the interpretations that he presents. <laughs>
Lines of Arabic poetry are commonly used as demonstrations of how a particular vocabulary word has been used in Arabic historically. And by the way, at tabari compiled his commentary 1,100 years ago or so, and the Arabic that's used today, modern standard Arabic, is not so different from the Arabic that he used back then. So contemporary readers of Arabic who have a formal education in Arabic typically do not find at tabaris work to be very difficult or taxing to understand, although it was written so long ago. This type of commentary came to be known as tafsir, a term that literally means explanation or interpretation. There is diversity among individual tafsirs, but one key feature is that they tend to be based on and cite heavily reports that were transmitted from early important members of the Muslim community and explanations of vocabulary that are based on the words attested usage in other Arabic sources such as poetry. Standing in contrast to approaches like that of al-Tabari was an approach that came to be known as ta'wil. Ta'wil typically refers to the discovery of subtle hidden meanings within verses. Although commentaries of this type can include transmitted knowledge, they've come to be most associated with the use of reason, personal opinion, and individual mystical experience and insight to understand the Quran's meanings. And that's especially the case in Shi'i and Sufi communities. Within Shi'i Islam, scholars have understood the Quran to have an outer dimension and an inner dimension. The outer dimension is understood to be the plain apparent meaning of a given verse, while the inner dimension contains hidden esoteric meanings. Within the largest branch of Shi'i Islam, known as Ithna Ashari or Twelver Shi'ism, the leader of the community, who is known as the Imam, has a special role in interpreting the Quran. The Imam is a chosen descendant of Muhammad and is understood to have special divine knowledge and as such to be the ultimate authority in interpreting the Quran. And here I'm drawing on the scholarship of Ismail Punawala, who's a renowned expert on that particular field. Within Sufi orders as well, there were individuals who were accorded a special status and recognized as having special access to hidden meanings of the Quran. Those who were chosen to receive this privileged knowledge did so through proximity to the divine. I'll briefly show you one example of an esoteric commentary by a Sufi commentator who is known as al Khushairi, one of the main leaders in the tradition, and he died in 1073 of the Common Era. We can see here his commentary on the same verse that we looked at before. It starts out with some explanations that are familiar from al tabaris commentary, although in this commentary by al Khushairi, the list of transmitters is not included. So he starts out with some things that we've seen before. Perhaps these are letters that are names of the surah, um, and they could be a name of God. But then he departs, and we see some new kinds of interpretations. And here these rely on knowing that the first of those three Arabic letters, the letter alif, is represented by a vertical line in Arabic. So we can see on the left part of the screen here, the letter alif is one vertical line that does not connect to the letter following it. Most of the time, Arabic letters connect to each other. This particular letter we call a non-connector. We have to pick up our pen after we write it. It does not connect to the next letter. So al qushayri suggests that this letter alif does not connect to the next letter in Arabic, thus evoking the idea that God is self-sufficient. He also says all the letters of the Arabic letter except the sound alif, which makes the a ah sound, have a place of articulation. Whereas alif, we just open our mouth completely to say that letter. Likewise, God is not ascribed or limited to any specific location. Lastly, he says the letter alif is set apart, that is, it doesn't connect to the next letter, and that's a reminder that the servant or the faithful worshiper of God who sets aside worldly distractions and turns their attention fully to the divine obtains a sublime rank of proximity to God. And he says that this verse has many meanings that are available for ordinary people, and many additional symbols and allusions that are available for the elect or those who have a special closeness to God, meaning there are hidden meanings in the verse that only the spiritual elite can gain access to. There's a huge range in both of these types of commentary, but this provides a taste of the distinction between the ex exoteric interpretation of the Quran's outer meanings of tafsir and the esoteric interpretation of the Quran's inner meanings known as ta'wil. So to sum up this point, as Islamic communities of thought and practice developed over time, two distinct approaches to Islamic exegesis or commentary emerged, tafsir and ta'wil. Anyone who had the proper training and qualifications could do tafsir, 
And specifically within Shi'i and Sufi communities, it was those with a special elite, re elite religious and spiritual status who could carry out the tatwil or interpretation of the Quran's inner hidden meanings. As far as the Sunni religious establishment was concerned, there was no problem with the existence of tatwil so long as it did not contradict the plain meaning of the text. But when it diverged widely or contradicted that plain meaning, and groups used it as a way to justify their own religious claims and doctrines, this was different. And members of the developing Sunni orthodoxy rejected that type of tatwil. It's important to keep in mind here that this interpretive activity had major implications for Islamic society, law, and practice. Thinking about all of this raises some important questions. Where do power and authority lie in each of these paradigms? Who has the right and the ability to access the text's meanings and on what basis? What is the legitimate way of understanding the Quran's verses? It's this type of significant and far-reaching questions that I think underlies the work of some of the most prominent scholars of classical Sunni Islam, and including al-Baqalani, who I think has yet fully to be understood. So at this point, let's turn to taking a look at the work of this scholar. Al-Baqalani, Abu Bakr al-Baqalani, lived in the 10th century and early 11th century in Baghdad. Baghdad at this time was a diverse cosmopolitan city and the capital of the caliphate or Islamic empire at that time, which was a Shiite caliphate. But both Sunnis and Shi'is of different schools and theological leanings lived in Baghdad. It was a time of flourishing for various areas of scholarship and production, including theology, jurisprudence, literature, engineering, architecture, agriculture, material culture, the list goes on. Remarkably, al-Bakalani was a tutor to the caliph's son, even though al-Bakalani was Sunni and the, the caliph and his family were Shiites. Even more remarkably, one of al-Bakalani's most prominent works of theology that's still central to understanding that school of theology to this day was written as a textbook um, or as a school text in his role of tutor. He was also a diplomat sent as an emissary to the Byzantine Empire to represent the caliphate. But later scholars who have studied and written on his work have done so in discipline-specific ways. So for example, literary scholars have paid great attention to his book on the literary features of the Quran. And scholars who are interested in Islamic law have looked very closely at how his legal theory contributed to that discipline, and so on and so forth. Reading al-Bakalani's work across all the fields that he wrote in, the thing that really stood out to me was his insistence on the Quran's clarity. That is, the Quran communicates with eminent clarity and there's no part of it that is unclear, opaque, or ambiguous. It's entirely accessible to humans' understanding and interpretation. And al-Bakalani actually maintains that it would not make logical sense for God to reveal a message to a community that could not fully understand it. Therefore, it stands to reason that the Quran's human audience should be able to access the Quran's meanings, he says, through its Arabic language medium. And there are related ideas that can be found earlier in the tradition as well. So Ibn Qutayba, a scholar who I mentioned earlier, said if a person doesn't understand what's going on in one of the verses of the Quran, the deficiency is in that person and not in the Quran. They should go back and study their Arabic grammar and vocabulary better. On the surface, it may seem self-evident that the Quran is to be accessed through the Arabic language, but in light of the controversy over different types of commentary and taking altogether al-Bakalani's body of work, it seems more likely that he is making an argument about the correct or proper way of interpreting the Quran. Moreover, it's surprising that he does so in striking places and uh, he does so in one genre largely in particular, which is his book about the Quran as a literary miracle, but I'll return briefly to the idea that he also brings up this idea in other surprising places. So on the screen here, we can see on the right a picture of the first page of a manuscript of his book about the Quran as a literary miracle. So as we saw earlier, the, the discourse about the Quran as a literary miracle has conventionally been understood to be one that answers the question, what does it mean for the Quran to be a miracle? What is it about its form, its style, its literary features that render it so excellent? But I see al-Bakalani is using this discourse in a surprising and innovative way, that is, as a platform for insisting on the Arabic language as the method through which a reader or interpreter can rightly access the Quran's meanings. That is, the secret of the Quran's eloquence is in its clarity and its accessibility through its Arabic language medium. We can see this idea woven into different places in al-Bakalani's work, 
He doesn't make the argument explicitly in any specific place, which may be why it hasn't previously been identified as one of his perennial concerns. Rather, his method is one of embedding this idea into various discussions about aspects of the Quran status. The presence of the argument becomes clear upon noticing two things. First, that it's an element that al-Bakalani includes in his work that doesn't appear in other scholars' work in analogous places, and noticing that these themes appear in really surprising places, as I'll return to in a moment. First, though, I'll present a couple of examples of places where al-Bakalani insists on the clarity of the Quran's meanings through the medium of the Arabic language. Al-Bakalani quotes the verse of the Quran that reads in a clear Arabic tongue more than any other single verse in his book on the Quran as a literary miracle, and he cites the Quran a lot in that book. So for example, he writes about the Quran that it does not cease elucidating, that is, it's entirely clear, continuously clear, as it is said in a clear Arabic tongue. He underlines that clarity with sentences like this one. God made it easy to comprehend, its wording bringing its meaning into the mind and the expression of its sense racing to the soul. He also presents a few different interpretations of the disconnected letters that we saw earlier, but all of them insist on the clarity of this feature of the Quran. He never allows for the idea that they may be ambiguous or opaque in meaning, an idea that could open up the door for suggesting that privileged divine knowledge is needed in order to access their hidden meanings. So, for example, he presents the idea that the disconnected letters at the beginning of a surah are an announcement of that surah being made up of Arabic letters and words arranged in the clearest and most excellent way. And he addresses some specific openings of surahs that begin with these letters. And here's one example that draws on that same set of letters that we looked at earlier, alif, lam, mim. So in this example, um, he spells out the logic of their arrangement as he sees it using the linguistic place of articulation of the three letters mentioned. So he says alif is pronounced all the way back in the back of the throat, lam is kind of pronounced toward the middle of the mouth, and mim is pronounced ma all the way at the front of the mouth. He says, these letters are hence an announcement that the Quran uses all letters known to its Arabic speaking audience. Hence, they are not mysterious letters at all, but quite the opposite. They're signs that draw attention to the familiar elements of the words and language of the Quran. They announce the Quran's comprehensibility to all who understand these letters by means of the Arabic language. And here's another explanation that al-Baqalani gives um, about the meaning of such uh, sets of letters. He says the most correct of what's been said about their meaning is that God revealed these letters at the beginning of surahs to represent all the rest of the letters of the Arabic alphabet. So they're kind of a metonymy or a synecdoche. They gesture toward the full Arabic alphabet by using example of three different letters. So he says, all speech is limited, all, all Arabic speech is encompassed by these letters of the alphabet, even if the arrangement differs, right? So we can arrange different letters into words and into phrases and sentences and paragraphs, but at their core, they're all made up of these same set of letters. Uh, the Quran mentions these letters repeatedly as an affirmation for the Arabs to know that the Quran is an address to them in their own language. Al-Bakalani also uses his legal theory and his theology texts as ways of communicating and insisting on this thesis. And it's really striking and unusual that he does this specifically in a legal theory text because neither he nor any other legal theory scholar who I'm aware of claimed that these disconnected letters had any legal bearing or any legal significance. So it's really odd to, and really striking to bring up the disconnected letters in a, in a book about law and legal um, frameworks. Noticing how al-Bakalani repeatedly creates occasions on which to insist on the clarity of the entire Quran through its Arabic language medium opens up a new perspective on this scholar and shaper of Islamic thought. There are many more examples of ways al-Bakalani advanced this thesis of the Quran as being accessible through the Arabic language, and I'm currently in the process of bringing together and situating these contributions as I work on my project. Still, the examples I've shown here provide an idea of the ways in which he embeds in his writings his insistence on the Arabic language as the medium through which the Quran's meanings can be clearly understood. Seeing this against the backdrop of the disagreement about who can access the Quran's meanings and how helps draw into relief the nature of al-Bakalani's contribution. At this point, I'd like to turn to summing up some key implications of his ideas and some broader concluding thoughts. So all of this raises some broader questions about interacting with scriptural language. Who has the authority to interpret it? 
What happens when dramatically different interpretations arise? What implications does that have for the locus of power and authority within a community? And for that community's shared beliefs, practices, and for personal faith. Framed in this way, there's exciting potential to think about these questions in dialogue with discussions of interpreting scriptures from other, Islam, from other religious traditions as well. And more specifically, what are the implications of al-Baqalani's view of who can understand and interpret the Quran? In his view, direct access to the Quran's meanings relies on the proper training that the interpreter has, not a privileged spiritual status. Those who have the requisite knowledge of Arabic and training and receive knowledge, such as the transmitted reports that trace back to Muhammad and his companions and successors, as well as the Arabic poetic heritage, can bring that knowledge to bear on the Quran's verses in order to understand them. Obtaining this training is, in principle, open to anyone. And in fact, there were plenty of non-native speakers of Arabic and scholars who are not ethnically or culturally Arab who did learn Arabic and become prominent scholars and interpreters of the Quran, among whom is At-Tabari, the first interpreter who we saw earlier. So one of the major giants of this tradition was actually Persian and learned Arabic and then crafted this uh, very prominent exegesis. The important thing was that scholars' training allowed them access and insight into the communal resources that served as the basis for interpreting the Quran in light of received wisdom and the established meanings of vocabulary, grammar, and idioms in the Arabic language. Basing interpretation of the Quran on these shared communal resources meant that access to the Quran's meanings was also not limited by time or by space. By the same token, this method rejects the idea that a special chosen status or insider knowledge is necessary or warranted to understand the Quran's meanings. I would also say that it could ensure a degree of consistency from one interpreter to the next and from one generation to another. Finally, it also closes off the potentially problematic possibility that some parts of the Quran could be unavailable for humans to understand at all. Reading al-Bakalani's work interdisciplinarily is what led me to recognize his consistent interest in furthering this thesis across his whole body of work. It also suggests potential for interest in conversations with work beyond the Arabo-Islamic context. What's exciting is that there's a lot more still to discover about what al-Baqalani and his peers thought, and many rare manuscripts have recently been discovered, published, um, edited, and some of these have been on the, on the shelves of manuscript libraries in Turkey, in India, and in other countries for centuries, and are recently being newly rediscovered, which is really exciting. So it's truly an exciting time to be thinking about how the Quran and the scholarly traditions it inspired have become a rich heritage that has been flourishing for more than a millennium. So I'd like to, to thank you all for, for listening. Um, these are some of the references that I've used in preparing this presentation today, and I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, so we've got time for questions, and those of you who are t tuning in online, you can put questions into the chat. Um, I'm going to just ask a, a quick thing, though. I was quite struck by a comment that you made that um, commentary written in, uh, I guess, over a millennial ago is still directly comprehensible to an educated Arabic speaker. And I teach 16th century English, which is difficult uh, for a lot of people. That's only 500 years ago. So I'm wondering, is it, does the Quran have something to do with that, given that, uh, given its status as a perfect literary miracle? Are, are these two things connected? Yeah, thank you for that excellent question. Uh, it's a topic that I'm excited to talk about. And in fact, I would say that there is a, a close relationship there. If it's important um, in every generation, in many different communities, to have a direct understanding of the Quran and its language and its meanings, that really, in a sense, anchors the language so that it, it doesn't deviate as much or doesn't move as much from one generation to the next. Um, and uh, another aspect of that is that the relevance and the significance of the poetry tradition and of the literary tradition. So up until today, pre-Islamic poetry, right, so from the 5th century, 6th century of the Common Era, is accorded a very privileged status. And up until today, um, people memorize these, or sometimes poems that are more than 100 lines long. And these are in classical Arabic from so many centuries ago. But there's an enduring importance to understanding that language and being able to access it. 
in addition to that, Arabic is um, what we could call a diglossic or a polyglossic or multiglossic language, meaning that there are different varieties of it. So while um, fusha or formal Arabic can remain fairly um, unchanging or it, it develops stylistically over time. So one of the main differences between Arabic that al-Tabari used and Arabic that's contemporary would be stylistic rather than grammatical or in terms of vocabulary. So that is occurring, but at the same time, spoken Arabic, colloquial varieties or dialects of Arabic are changing much more rapidly. So in some realms of daily life, a lower register or more informal language would be used. And often that's not written down. It hasn't been written much until fairly recently with social media. It's, it's, it's gaining more written presence. But historically, it's been largely an oral variety of Arabic that can change more rapidly, that can vary a lot uh, locally and geographically, whereas that common language of formal Arabic, that higher register, does change less rapidly and some would say remain a lot more constant. So I think it's a question of language varieties, um, but as well when we look under the surface at what's motivating you know, these different language varieties, I think that the, under, the importance of understanding core text, the Quran, classical Arabic poetry, classical Arabic commentaries, is a huge motivator for maintaining an individual connection in every generation to that language that was used so many centuries ago and continues to be used today. Thank you for that question. That's, that's a great question. So the question is about, uh, is it true that historically it was forbidden uh, to translate the Quran and is that still the case? Uh, one answer to that question is that it has been kind of a widely held belief that translating the Quran is not possible because the Quran defines itself as being in Arabic, right? It's so self-referential and there are many verses where the Quran defines itself as being in Arabic. So that has led to an idea that it cannot be translated. Once it's translated, it is no longer Quran. You could call it a rendering of the Quran or the meanings of the Quran. So in fact, many um, English language and other language renderings of the Quran do not call themselves translation. So some of the most famous, what you might pick up and say, okay, this is a translation of the Quran into English. A lot of them don't call themselves translations. They would call themselves renderings, interpretations, um, on this idea that as soon as an interpreter is, or a translator is entering into that equation and the translator is making individual decisions about how to translate words and how to arrange sentences in, that, um, in the target language, that it's no longer the direct word of God. So that definitely is a prevalent idea. What I found really interesting is looking at some of the classical commentary, some of the classical tafsir, including by at who, who we looked at earlier, they don't actually come down firmly on that side that the Quran is untranslatable. So in places where they, they could have done so, a lot of commentators and interpreters do leave it more open. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a complex issue where, where I, there's not really a consensus, but the, the Arabic language of the Quran still has a very privileged status. So for example, in worship settings, liturgical settings, um, there are some contexts where the Quran, as rendered in other languages, would not be in use. Oops. Go here. Uh, so I have a, a question from online. Um, what is the Shia and Sufi response to the idea that the Quran is accessible to anyone who learns the Arabic language without the need of a so-called divine individual, as al-Bakalani suggests? That's also a fantastic question. I'm a little hesitant to make too broad a statement because there is such great diversity, both historically and in terms of geography and in terms of individual communities as well. So there is a lot of nuance here, but my broad answer would be um, within many 
communities, this idea of a privileged member of the community or privileged members of the community having specific types of access to hidden meanings of the Quran, that is kind of an added bonus onto the, the I wouldn't say the literal meaning, but the plain meaning of the text, right? So that plain meaning can include things like metaphor, can include things like simile and idiom, so I'm not gonna say literal meaning, but um, so I'll, I'll say, especially in some Sufi traditions with which I am most familiar, there is a kind of a hierarchy, right? So that anybody can access some meanings of the Quran, but those who have a privileged status of proximity to God, which could be developed through joining and working up the ranks of a Sufi order, through practices such as asceticism, trying to leave behind worldly concerns, that gaining that privileged status of closeness to God does allow that interpreter to have access to more meanings, spiritual meanings on different levels um, that are seen as an enhancement. So many times that isn't in direct opposition to the plain meaning of the text, and that's where that, um, that uh, more divisiveness comes into play is where there was an idea among some groups that those hidden meanings where they did lie in opposition to the plain meaning were truer meanings or more authentic meanings. That's where there, there's some divisiveness, but there certainly has been a lot of uh, back and forth and discourse about this over time. Thank you for your presentation. I had a question. Uh, when you start uh, introducing the Allah Kalam, uh, you mentioned that uh, he has been living in the era of uh, Shia Kirli, but uh, as far as I know, all of the uh, Abbasid dynasty caliphs were Sunni. Who do you mean by the Shia caliphs of the, of the time of al -Bakilah? That's a great question. So he lived in what's called sometimes the Persian or the Iranian intermezzo. So he lived during the Buyid Caliphate. So this was at the time when the Abbasid Caliphate that had been the main power before this was still kind of a figurehead, but it was receding in the amount of power that it had. So he lived in the Buyid era. Yeah. Most of the, I mean, at least in the Muslim communities, uh, they believe that, for example, after the Umayyad Caliphate, there, there has been a bus kid. I mean, most of the, as far as they have heard, uh, uh, the Buyid is known as just a local government in Iran, not as the Caliphate, uh, as the Islamic Caliphate. However, for example, in the Egypt, there has been a Caliphate, uh, maybe a a few centuries later, uh, if you have uh, heard it about as uh, Atemia, they are so somehow known as that. But the Buyid, uh, uh, do you say do you think it can be called them as the branch of Caliphate? So I am drawing on some recent scholarship in calling it that, yes, but that's a great question. So the Abbasid Caliph, so this was one of the, some people call this kind of a golden age and that they were in power for a pretty long time, but even though the Abbasids did remain figureheads for a pretty long time after they had, at, were at the, the fullness of their power, and there was some receding of that power, and that's where the Buyids come into effect. The Fatimids, who you mentioned, the Fatimid Caliphate, was also overlapping at this time, and it's really interesting that the Buyids and the Fatimids had kind of a rivalry or an opposition to each other. So the Fatimids would send um, uh, missionaries. There was missionary activity that was encour encouraging into the Buyid area, and the Buyids were, were not so happy about that missionary activity, which had different political aims, different religious aims. And part of the work that I'm currently doing, because there's some really recent interesting scholarship that's recently been published on this topic, is looking at what could people like al-Bakalani and his contemporaries have been reacting to kind of that might not have been put in writing. For example, actual missionary activity, right? Things that don't happen in text, but that were happening on the ground realities. So yeah, so absolutely there is dispute and there are different terms that could be used like caliphate, sultanate, empire, all sorts of different um, terms like this. Um, I won't get too technical here, but that's a fascinating issue and exactly the, the issue of the Fatimids is one that I'm actually currently looking into. What was their relationship with the Buyids? What sort of uh, tensions lie there that people uh, like al-Bakalani and his peers could have been responding to in their work? Okay. Um, 
here's another question from online, which I'm not sure I completely understand, but I hope you do. Uh, you mentioned that the Quran is in Arabic and that non-Arabic speakers often memorize the sounds. Since so much of the Muslim world is non-Arab, how do people who don't speak the language understand it? I do. I think I understand what the question is getting at, and I will answer in two parts. One is the process of memorization, and the other one is about accessing the meanings. So in terms of process of memorization, this can vary geographically, and I think also it's important to distinguish in time periods because, as I mentioned, now there are contemporary technologies that can help. I mean, there are, in some places, cassette tapes for a long time were quite popular, and now smartphones have, have come into the picture as well. Um, so there are, yeah, so the, re reciting, memorizing, um, and in some areas of the world there are things like Quran boards. Um, so kind of wooden tablets on which people can write the verses of the Quran and then the, the ink, um, they can wash off the ink and then that ink has a, a holy status as well because the word of God was written on that ink and then write new verses on that board as a way of aiding in memorization. Um, and in terms of assets and the meanings, um, there are what we could call translations or renderings or interpretations of the Quran in different languages that are, that are quite popular. Um, so for people who do not understand Arabic, it's quite common to use the aid of one of those, one of those uh, translations or renderings um, of the Quran's meanings into a different language. But it, accessing the Quran in the Arabic language is a motivator for people to learn Arabic around the world as well. I think that's another really key point. Here. your explanation on um, this debate and all the possibilities that this interpretation um, that this interpretation based on different fields and putting together different fields like through the interdisciplinarities can show. So my question is based on one of the openings that you are giving for um, how this new interpretation allows uh, new ways of confronting how other traditions also interpret their religious texts, and also how other traditions try to go on in dialogue with the Islamic tradition. I was especially fascinated by your examples um, about the three letters, and how you gave two different interpretations of the three letters, and then how the early interpretation of the three letters. And um, I'm specifically thinking, of course, of Ramon Lund, because that's where I come from. How he used to then that the Islamic tradition is building on the Islamic tradition of the name of God as one of the ways in which they could construct a dialogue through the use of reason in order to like in order to try to fix each other or at least um, at least to have a have a, again like conversation. So one of the things that struck me was that the first commentary um, and the second agreed on one thing specifically, which was the fact that the three letters were in the name of God. And instead of a kind of what so how was Al Bakali like I was really curious about what is his position with the be the name of God? Mm. Thanks for that question, yeah. So it's important to mention here the idea, um, which is a prevalent idea of a 99 beautiful names of God, which um, al-asma al-husna in Arabic. So um, there's an idea that even at his time was well known of God having 99 names, many of which are mentioned in the Quran. Um, and these mysterious letters are not traditionally to be understood among those 99. Um, so it's interesting that he's, he worked in so many different disciplines that were, I would say, Quran adjacent or Quran interested, right? So legal theory and using the Quran as a primary source of law, the idea of um, the status of the Quran, the literary excellence of the Quran, but he never did exegesis himself. So not all of his books are extant until today. Um, there are accounts from uh, contemporaries of his and biographical dictionaries that indicate he wrote probably about 50 or 55 books about 12 to 14 of those are fully or in part extant today. Um, but no, yeah, so those accounts do not include the idea that he himself wrote exegesis. So he certainly does um, do what I would call interpretive activity in his books where he, he points to verses of the Quran, he explains ways of interpreting them, 
Um, but he does not aim for co like being comprehensive in that. So, and it's interesting that in different places he does have slightly different interpretations that he puts forward of these letters. The thing that I found really striking is that he has a specific goal in that of saying that these are announcements that the Quran is in Arabic. It is accessible through Arabic to its interlocutors, but he doesn't really go through a list of here are other possible meanings or here are other ways that th these types of verses have been understood. Okay, so here's another one from online. Given, um, I, think, I think this is the preface, but given that uh, al-Bakalani says that uh, reading the Quran is just about putting in the work, um, could women also be accepted as val valid interpreters of the holy books? Yeah, so that's a great question as well. Um, and in my conclusion, when I was saying, well, in theory, anyone can get that training and access the Quran, um, there are different social realities. Um, and again, I, I, I will make a comment on it, but I don't want to overgeneralize because there are different realities in different places and times. That, and getting this kind of training was available to different populations in these different communities. So. Um, uh, yeah, some training was not equally available to everyone. I think that part is fair to say. And it's interesting that there definitely have been and were uh, female interpreters of the Quran and uh, female jurisprudence, female lawyers, female um, religious leaders of different kinds. Uh, the, the, the one who probably wrote the most, the most prolific, was a scholar named Aisha al -Baronia. Um, and she died, and she lived in the Mamluk, um, Mamluk, Egypt. She died in 1517, and she was um, she was a Sufi, but she was also um, a jurisprudent. She was active in the legal tradition. She was a prolific poet as well. Um, and what's really interesting is that she does a lot of exegetical work. She does a lot of interpretive work of the Islamic tradition of the Quran through her poetry, which is super fascinating. Um, but uh, there, yeah, so when we talk about these hierarchies, one of the interesting parts is that saying, okay, in a tradition such as Sufism, not, it's not universally understood that there has to be that full formal training that takes place in order to reach proximity to, the God, to God, um, different forms of training, ascetic practices, mentioning God's name, um, other spiritual and mystical practices um, can, um, can be more prominent so that there have been a lot of female um, scholars, poets um, in the Sufi tradition. Um, and so it's interesting to think about how these different hierarchies work and who they include and who they exclude. If the hierarchy is dependent on a spiritual merit, if it's dependent on training in the Arabic language, if it's dependent on a full training in, say, Arabic grammar and the different Islamic sciences, it's interesting to, to see like, uh, where those lines get drawn. And so that's part of what's on my mind when I'm asking about where these different paradigms place the locus of power and authority within a community. Who has the right to interpret um, and on what basis? Another question here. Hi, so you mentioned earlier that um, there's a lot of spoken Arabic varieties, and I was just curious if there's any specific region or people or variety that's closest to classical Arabic and like how that helps the understanding of the meaning behind it. That's a fantastic question. And um, if you ask a contemporary Arabic speaker which variety of Arabic is closest to the standard, you'll get lots of different answers. Um, a lot of people uh, understand their own dialect to be the closest because they can understand their own dialect and they can understand standard Arabic, so uh, they can see the proximities between the two. Um, there have been linguistic studies on this, and they've indicated that different spoken colloquial varieties of Arabic today have different types of proximity and distance to standard Arabic. So if we look at vocabulary, we might get one answer. If we look at grammar, if we look at pronunciation, we get different answers. Um, so I think, uh, I would say from a scholarly point of view, looking at the different dialects, they all have interesting areas of overlap and proximity to classical and standard Arabic, and yet have their own distinct um, characteristics. Um, and a lot of spoken varieties of Arabic have been influenced as well by other languages that are spoken by those communities who also speak those varieties of Arabic. So for example, in North Africa, so Morocco, Mauritania, um, Libya, Egypt, Algeria, we, um, Tunisia, we get uh, influence of, say, French, right? There's a French colonialism. Um, now, influence of Egypt, 
or of, of English entering um, with certain vocabulary words. Um, Tamazight, one of the indigenous languages of that region, also has some words that have entered uh, the North African Darija or dialect of Arabic. So it's interesting to see every, every dialect does have some features that tie it closely to standard Arabic and yet differ. Um, and I would say, yes, different people have strong views on which one is the closest. <laughs> I don't think there's a clear answer myself. Down here. Have to make sure it's on. Thank you. Yep. Um, uh, you mentioned your your scholarly lens of compan scholarly companionship. That seems to be an interesting trick for somebody who died a thousand years ago. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by scholarly companionship and what? Uh, modes and methods you're bringing to this discourse about this person's discourses? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So um, it's true. When I say scholarly companionship, I cannot be in direct two-way companionship with al Bakalani and his peers because um, they unfortunately died a thousand years ago. But, but um, I think it's really important that in addition to my studies, say, at in the University of California or in North America, um, I've also spent a lot of time studying alongside um, theological scholars in Morocco. So Al-Bakalani came from that same theological and uh, legal theory school that is practiced in Morocco up until today. So I think it's important for me to be studying the text that he and his peers wrote not simply by myself in a library or with other scholars in North America, but also to be studying um, in conjunction with communities who still um, consider those texts to be ones that they consider um, central to their own practices today. Um, and specialists in those texts from Morocco, and I also spent time studying in Yemen and uh, doing manuscript research in Tunisia. So it's important for me to be in dialogue with different communities who have different um, lenses through which they view these texts and the discussions that come out of them. How is al-Bakalani and the discussions that um, his work sparked, how are those alive today, right? So where are those alive today? Um, how can I discuss my work with people from different communities of interpretation who might have different lenses through which then I can bring to my work new insights? So it's really a matter of, um, I think, being in scholarly companionship with, uh, with different communities who have different relationships to these texts. Few uh, questions ago, you in part of your answer said something that I thought was very, very beautiful. You mentioned that when people are writing phrases from the Quran, that the ink that gets washed away is now considered holy. And since holiness couldn't be removed from deity, this washed ink is now all around. I wonder if you could just amplify on that a bit. Yeah, for sure. So these Quran boards are um, used in some regions. So uh, I would say Sudan is, is famous for having these Quran boards, but I've also uh, come into personal contact with their use in um, areas of, uh, say, southern Morocco and Mauritania, disputed area, some call the Western Sahara, some call the Moroccan Sahara. Um, so these are still used up until today. And um, the practice, I understand it, and this may have some regional variation, is one of using these um, boards and ink that uh, is written on them, the verses of the Quran, as a tool to help memorize those verses, right? So almost like a, um, a learning tool. And that when those verses of the Quran, when the practice moves on to a next verse, the uh, water is used to wash away and then um, collect, that water is collected and used for holy ritual purposes, which I would say is not my area of expertise. I know it can be in some communities used for, um, for ritual ablutions, but I, um, I'm not an expert on its use uh, in wider geographical use. Are there other questions? Well, perhaps, oops, perhaps that's a, a, a good place uh, to end this on. So I just want to thank you once again for a, a fascinating talk about communities of interpretation, which, which of course we are as well. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here tonight, both online, but also 
a great crowd out here at the library, which is uh, one of the great anchors in, in our culture uh, of civil and civic conversation. Um, but please join me in, in thanking once again our speaker, Dr. Rachel Friedman.